Hi everyone, it's Jeanette here from the Sewing Studio. Uh, welcome, I was going to say to a tutorial, it's probably a little bit of an add-on video actually. Um, and it's come as a result of the um, compilation video we did at the end of the year. Um, first of all, I need to thank everybody for all your lovely comments, all your New Year wishes. Um, I was reading through all the comments over Christmas and the New Year period and uh, it was just lovely. Um, made me smile and just gave me a, a lovely warm fuzzy feeling. Um, so we've got some, some, some great, great viewers out there that uh, sort of engaged with us and uh, like I say, shared all those good wishes. But on some of those comments and queries we were getting, um, there was a few queries that were saying about, can we see a bit more about how you quilt on home sewing machines? And I noticed there were some comments from beginner quilters. Um, so we thought what we would do is take this opportunity to do a little introduction video, um, I guess, about sort of quilting on home sewing machines and really sort of take it back to basics a little bit. Um, and also give you a little bit of a close up on some of the quilts that we were talking about in that compilation video. Um, and we'll put the link to that here. So if people haven't seen that and they want to go and watch it, please feel free. So as I said, I thought I would sort of start from a viewpoint of, you know, assume no prior knowledge um, and just talk about some of the things that I use in my quilting. And I've got some bits and pieces and some tools that I brought with me to share with you. And then I've got some examples and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the decisions uh, that influence how I quilt something and why I might quilt something a particular way. So probably the first thing to start with is I'm, I'm a glue baster. Um, so I use the uh, 505 spray when I'm layering up my quilts. The first thing to say about this is less is more. Um, the biggest mistake I see people making with this is, is they sort of really spray it on like, you know, we used to in the old days with hairspray. Um, and actually you don't need that much. Sort of definitely less is more for this. Um, if you sort of saturate it too much, it, you, you could end up with a bit of a sticky mess on your hands. So sort of less is more for the use of the 505 spray, but I find everything goes down really flat with it. It's really quick and it lasts for a long time. I've got quilts at home that I layered four or five years ago. They get moved around and the layers are still all stuck together. The other tip I will give you for using this is spray the wadding or the batting, not your fabric. Um, just leave it for a couple of seconds to go tacky and then sort of smooth everything down. So I'm definitely a, a spray baster. But of course, you can use your chosen preferred methods, um, pinning, hand tacking, whatever you like to do. But I definitely find the glue based uh, works really well and it's quick and effective. Um, the next bit I'm going to talk about is sort of marking tools. Now, I tend to use either a, a water erasable pen or a chalk pen. You can see this one's very well loved. There's only a little bit of chalk but you can get refills for this and you can get the chalk in different colors so it shows up on different colored fabrics. But those are my two preferred methods of marking my quilt tops. I don't tend to use heat erasable tools because I don't often wash my projects as soon as they're finished. And I find with the heat erasable tool, you've still left the ink in there um, and it, it, it can sort of come back and cause problems. The other thing I've had it in the past is where I've heat erased it. Sometimes it's, it's bleached out where the, the um, ink has been and it's left sort of like a ghost mark in my fabric. So I do use heat erasable pens in sewing, but not for marking quilts. I'll, I'll tend to use those in any areas that's not gonna be seen. So if there are any problems, um, you know, it doesn't affect anything. But you know, you do you, if you have a success using those sorts of tools and absolutely carry on doing it. I know a lot of people will make a quilt and then immediately wash it. So that sort of eradicates that problem a little bit. Now, the other thing I'm going to talk about um, is the quilter's pounce is the other thing I will use. And it's a little gadget that looks like this. So for those of the age, which I am, that remembers the old blackboards in schools, it, it looks a bit like a blackboard rubber. Um, and you've got sort of a recess here that you fill with powdered chalk and you use that with stencils. So let me just bring this in because this is probably the next tool we're going to talk about. And you can buy these stencils for all sorts of different things. Um, these are just a, a selection of, of some of the ones that I've brought in from home that I've got. And I'll just sort of lay these out one at a time. I'll put that one in the, the close up so you can sort of see. This is for one for doing um, corners. This is one that you use. It's got um, for borders and you can also get, sorry, I should say that one is more for when you you just want to quilt within a block and you get, you quite often will get different sizes on a stencil. Uh, and this is one that I use when I'm free motion and this is more for an all over 
pattern. But this is where this quilt pounce um, comes into its being. You just sort of wipe over and the powdered chalk goes through the stencils and marks your quilt. So it marks it really quickly and easily. But if you don't have a quilter's pounce, you can just draw through with one of your other options for marking. These are the chalks come in. This is a white one. You can also get them in blue and pink. So once again, it will show up on different colored fabrics, but that's a really sort of quick and simple way for transferring designs from a stencil. Um, I will say if you've got a stencil that you're going to use for free motion, look for ones that have got sort of a continuous line that you can follow. Um, they tend to work better for, and I've used um, that last stencil, the all over design in the uh, children's star quilt that we did last year in the, in the border of that one. That's the stencil I used for that one. So just the final thing I wanted to talk about was then the actual feet themselves. As I said, I'm not covering free motion in, in um, this today. We may do something a bit more. Uh, again, we did cover a little bit of free motion when we were quilting a cushion back at the tail end of last year. Um, so if you're interested in have a look at that, you can have a look at that. We may do something again. Um, but I know a lot of people don't always get on with free motion. So I'm going to sort of start by talking about sort of using straight lines and things, some simple options, and then perhaps we'll do something a, a, a bit different a bit later on. Now, the next thing to say is about the walking foot or dual feed. This is actually um, what is called a dual feed foot for my machine, but you can get walking feet as well. They do the same job. And basically they're designed to feed the fabric through all the layers through at the same rate. So uh, can you quilt with that one? Yes. Do you get such a good result? No, not in my opinion. Um, I found that if I've just used a normal foot to try to do quilting, particularly on a big project, on something small, sometimes you can make it work, but the fabrics do move at different rates and quite often you will quilt in tucks and pleats um, and even sort of air pockets a little bit under your layers. Um, so if you're gonna be doing a lot of, of quilting, it is worth investing in a walking foot or a dual feed. And I would highly recommend that you get the, the, the right one for your machine. Um, I don't tend to get generic things. I tend to get the ones because you know it's gonna work and you know it's gonna fit. If you're a bit stuck on which ones for your machines, I know the staff here are brilliant. Um, you know, we sell uh, different, different machines here, with different accessories. So you can always get in contact with them and, and they can advise you which ones to get for your uh, machines. They're always happy to do that. Uh, but quite often, like I say, it might be a walking foot or it might be a dual feed. Some machines might have an integral uh, dual feed mechanism in there that you can sort of engage. So do have a look at your machine. And if you're not sure, check your manual, check your instruction book that came with the machine. Um, this came with my machine. So some machines, these feet come with it. Um, if you've got quilters editions of machines, quite often sort of accessories will come with it that you're going to need. Um, now, with this came with my machine and it also came with something which is called a quilting guide which I'm just going to put here under the close up. And it's just a little bar that fits in to that gap there into the foot. It might slide through or it might sort of click into place depending on what your walking foot would look like. And the whole idea is then you can sort of adjust the position of that. And once I've sewn one seam I, or even a, a seam that's either in the patchwork or a, a stitch line, I can use that to then measure off um, and you can make that whatever width you want. And I'm going to show you some examples where I've done that on the quilts I've got here. Um, now this one, the actual sole of this, it's sort of quite hard to do. Um, it's easier to do on the machine. So it, it, different soles will clip into there. That's the one I use for quarter of an inch. So I use that one when I'm putting on my binding, but quite often I'll either use the general foot, which this one came with, or this one that was an additional per, per, uh, purchase and it was a stitch in the ditch foot. And if I just hold that to the side, you can see it's got this bar in the center. And the whole idea is, is you run that bar along your seam, your needles in your central position right behind it, and it will be following along uh, directly behind. So as I said, I'll talk a little bit more. I've done, I've got an example of a stitch in the ditch uh, where I've used that. So we can sort of see that in action if you like. So let's see if I can clip that back in there. So these are hard to do. There we are. It's done. It's not hard to do on the machine. It's hard to do holding it. So let's have a look at some examples where I've used straight stitch using um, these feet on some quilts. So the first quilt I'm just gonna share with you, it was just all quilted with straight lines. Now I will say normally one of the considerations I give before um, I, I even thread a needle is time. How much time, realistically, how much time do I actually have to quilt something? 
you know, quite often we need to get things done. Um, so that is a factor that um, does come into consideration. This was a small quilt, so it, it wasn't too big a consideration for this one. Um, there were several ways I could have gone with it, but in the end I decided, because of the size of the blocks and the size of the pieces, I thought that sort of just uh, sort of um, vertical straight line quilting would work really well and sort of fairly close together. Now, the other thing to remember is the more thread, the more quilting you do, the sort of denser, the stiffer your quilt becomes. So if you want a quilt that you're going to snuggle under, you know, definitely make the spacing of that further apart because it will make your quilts a lot softer. Um, but this is just a small quilt um, and, I, and I sort of went for something that was sort of in proportion to the size of the pieces that was in this quilt. So what I decided to do with this one is in the, sort of the central section, just do vertical lines and then in the inner and outer borders, I've done something which I call my framing borders. Now, that's, I don't think it's a technical term, that's just the way I've sort of named it in my head over the years. But I'll show you that in a minute, but I'll just talk a little bit about the straight line quilting. My go-to stitch length is a 3.0 anytime I'm quilting. Um, that's my go-to length. I find it's not too big, but it's not too small. Um, it just hits that sweet spot. And these, I just started somewhere in the center um, with one line. I don't think I even drew a line on this one. I think I just followed a seam and just made sure I, was, I kept the sort of spacing between that first line of stitching and the seam the same all the way down. But you generally tend to start quilting from the center and work your way out. And that means, you know, you're sort of smoothing out any sort of air pockets or air bubbles as you go and you don't end up with a piece in the middle there that's, that's got sort of a lot of air or a lot of fabric in it. Now these, I think if I measure them, they came out about five eighths. Now I I'm quite often don't measure, I just sort of do something by, by eye and thought that looks about right. So once I'd put, um, you know, sort of the one stitch in, you know, if I can sort of imagine that that now is on my sewing machine, I can sort of position my needle where it's gonna be and then the, the quilt guide. And then once I've got one in, I can just keep stitching and then I can use that guide to go back and forth and all my lines will stay equidistant. So you don't have to be drawing on all those lines, which is time consuming. So the, uh, the, the, the quilt guide is a really useful tool. I use it all the time. Um, sometimes I, I will even use it for sort of top stitching if there's a, an odd space I need to get to. Um, because I say it just gives you that, that guide that you can sort of run off, off the, the edge of a seam or, or whatever. So that's really quick and simple. Now, the other thing I just want to mention is what I call my framing border. And I know, like, as I said, we had a question about this. So I'm just gonna move the quilt up and hopefully get that in uh, well under the close up. So the corner is there. Um, and this is what I mean by a framing border. Basically, it's just a straight stitch that you go all the way along in, and then when you get to the corner, you go 90 degrees and you go off in the other direction. So that, that happens on all four corners. So you end up quilting in a frame. And I use it on inner borders and outer borders. Um, and the, the trick to getting the place where you need to turn is if you draw a, a diagonal line from your two points, and then as you sew along, when you hit that line, you know that's the point that you need to, to stop and change direction. So that's what I mean by a framing border. Like I say, it's my terminology um, of just how I sort of quilt things in. The other thing to stay this, you know, don't have to be perfectly straight, just stay as straight as you can. Don't get too, um, too overwhelmed by, oh, I must keep straight, I must keep straight. In the end of the, of the day, for any of these lines, you know, we're adding functionality to hold those layers together, but also we're just putting texture into the quilt. And quite often when we're working on top of it, we see every little wobble, every little mistake. But when we stand back and look at it all, it all comes out in the wash. So by the time you've quilted it all, quite often you don't see those mistakes. Um, and don't forget, it is still just stitching. So if there is a mistake in there you don't like, you can unpick and go back and do it again. So, um, you know, sort of don't stress too much about it. You know, enjoy the process. Um, and I always love the texture uh, quilting adds to the quilt. And a, a finished quilted quilt is better than one that's just sort of left rolled up in a box or on top of a cupboard. So this was our red and white log cabin quilt. And I'm just gonna hold it there. There was two techniques I used in it, well, including actually three, because I did my framing border on this out in the border again. But on this one, I've used straight line quilting, but in a slightly different way. Let's just make sure I get that under the close up. I think that's there. Now in this one, I did something which I call echo quilting. And all you do with that 
is um, you just sort of stay equidistance away from that seam and I keep going for as, as far as I can and I start by sort of tracing my finger and you can sort of see in the background squares I've gone all the way along just just following those seams trying to keep as close as possible to the same distance apart now once again if you're not exact distance all the way around all of it you're probably never going to see it so don't worry too much and then I keep going keep going keep going and I think I ended up sort of going around this central square with this um, and then finish there. So I try to do it in one continuous line. I'll find a path that goes all the way around so I don't have to keep starting and stopping and I'm not going to have lots of tails to sort of tie off and, and bury in to my quilt at the end of it. So that's what I did in all of the white background log cabin blocks. And then in all of the red ones, I did a stitch in the ditch. So once again, this is where this foot came into its own. So we're just going to run that foot. Let's just put that under the close up so you can see it a bit better. And let's say that that bar then would run along that seam and your needle would be following behind that. Um, just the other, the other thing to say with that one, all stitch in the ditch means is you're, you're trying to stitch right into the, the seam. So where those two seams come, come together, that's the ditch basically. Just the other thing to say about this quilt is I used uh, a pale coloured, a sort of creamy coloured thread for the white areas, but I did change to a, a burgundy for um, the stitch in the ditch. Because if you do go a little bit off, if you've got a light coloured thread, you are going to see it. So if I just turn the quilt over to the back, you'll be able to see there where I've got the, um, the burgundy thread and then I've got the, uh, the light coloured thread. And I don't mind that. I don't mind having different coloured threads on the back of the quilt. It's absolutely fine. So the final one, I'm going to say I've saved the best till last because I love this quilt and anybody that's watched the compilation will know that this is my favourite quilt from 2023. Um, I just love everything about it. But once again, I just used a straight stitch to quilt this. Um, and I made that decision because I felt that there was quite a lot of work going on with the, with the blocks, with the patchwork, and I didn't feel it needed anything particularly fancy. Um, and the quilt design I chose was really just a gentle wave to contrast to all the straight lines in the blocks. So that's another way to go. You don't have to keep with straight lines just because you've got straight lined piecing in your quilts. Um, but I love how this came out. Um, two things, the thread color I used was like a very pale peach color. When you're going over lots of different colors of um, fabric, quite often a sort of a, a pastel, a pale colored thread works better than a sort of cream or a white. And as a general rule of thumb, a light thread on a dark fabric looks better than a dark thread on a light fabric. So I tend to go light and choose something that blends quite well. So this one was uh, sort of a pale peach and you can sort of see it uh, there a little bit in the, in the blocks and, and very much here in, in the, um, the sashing. But all I did for this quilt design, as I said, it was straight stitch. I used my walking foot again with the, uh, with the guide and I just drew in the centre of a quilt, um, I drew one curvy wave line right across the width of the quilt um, in my chalk. And then I sort of stood back, had a look at it and thought, actually, is, is, does that look about right? I made a couple of an adjustments. Um, the trick with this one is you want to think rolling, rolling mountains or rolling hills rather than steep mountains and valleys. Because with this, you want to try and keep sewing in a nice, smooth, gentle way. And if you've got very steep peaks and troughs in it, that becomes more difficult. So just sort of think gentle rolling hills. So I, once I've drew my one line on, I stitch that. I spaced it about a quarter of an inch apart, or sorry, one inch and a quarter apart. And then I just used my, uh, my quilt guide to measure off that seam. The second thing to say about that is I didn't worry about staying on the stitch line exactly with this foot for this one. It's just as, as long as I was keeping the shape, that's all I worried about. Um, and also just making sure my distances sort of stayed fairly equal. By quilting it slightly further apart, it makes the quilt uh, so much softer. And I just did edge to edge on that. So uh, ho horizontally across the whole quilt. And I, I really love the sort of texture and movement it came. So it was a really simple quilting idea, but it's, it's really quite effective. So that's three quilts, all quilted just using straight stitch on the same machines, quilted in slightly different ways, 
but really simple, really quick and um, quite effective and, and very beginner friendly, all of these techniques um, for these very beginner friendly. So hopefully that's given you some inspiration to perhaps how you might want to quilt some of your quilts. Um, like I said, we're all guilty of having those quilts that just, you know, we get stuck, don't we? When it gets to the quilter's desired stage, we get stuck. Um, so hopefully that's given you some ideas. Um, also, just to reiterate, don't forget, you know, we, we are a specialist in sewing machine here and its accessories. So if you are stuck about what accessory you might want to help you with your quilting, do get in touch. Um, all, all the staff here would be more than pleased to help you out on that. And, and we have got Anna, our sewing machine specialist, who can help as well. So for 2024, one of the plans I have is to do more of quilting on some projects and actually do them on some projects that we've perhaps shown you how to make. And then rather than me coming back, appearing with a, a finished project, actually quilt it along with you. So this is my invitation to you all to join me for that, to make the projects, have a go at some of the quilting and hopefully we can have some fun doing that this year. So if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe and you can hit that bell and it will notify you when we've released those videos, um, particularly the ones that are covering the quilting, you'll know about it. So uh, please support us in that way and come and join us and do that. It will be great fun to have you guys sewing along with me and doing some of these things and also sharing your photos of what you're doing. That will be absolutely fantastic. So thank you once again for joining me here today and I'll hope you'll join me here next time in the sewing studio.